do, do, do. Hello, River West Radio. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Brian. How are you? Good. Where are you, by the way? We are in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay. And right. right near the uh, the Great Milwaukee River, near the Great Lakes. Okay. And, um, yeah, and we have a small community radio station that uh, broadcasts uh, right now. We're you streaming, and we're working towards low-power FM. I just lost sound. Uh, thank you. <laughs> and um, what we do is uh, we offer people in the community to, you know, voice their their ideas, their issues. We're uh, kind of an eclectic neighborhood. A lot of artists live around here. And we're building a community radio station. We have a lot of co-ops. We have a okay. bar co-op. <laughs> very cool. Yeah, it is very cool. And um, so, well, let, let me start this way. I appreciate you, um, you know, being so flexible here. We had some difficulties uh, one way or the other. But uh, we're working those out. Okay. And uh, so welcome to Three Words. That's my show. Uh, this is Eliza Brooks broadcasting from River West Radio in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I know Brian Keith Dalton best for his creation of Mr. Deity. Mr. Deity is a series of short, albeit satirical, films that parody religion and religious thought. It challenges the biblical norms, addressing some pretty big and profound questions and beliefs. Brian is the creator, writer, actor, director, producer, and Mr. Deity himself. Uh, this show, in my opinion, is one of the best and most intelligent series on the Internet. Uh, I've been a fan and follower since January 2007. I remember clearly Mr. Deity Episode 3, Mr. Deity in the Light. Uh, very clever, witty, and it draws you in and finds a place where you can laugh at the silliness of religious dogma we all grew up with and at the same time question the too many religious norms we seem to accept. My first thought was, why can't TV be more like this? Mr. Deity has been running for four years now, along with the real-life sort of drama words, and a number of other entertaining creative fare that Brian Keith Dalton and his crew have developed. Mr. Deity is out on DVD, and you can purchase the first three seasons at Mr. Deity's website, along with all kinds of Deity swag, at MrDeity.com. That's M-R-D-E-I-T-Y.com. Greetings, Brian, and welcome to Three Words here at River West Radio. How's my begging? Hello, that was great. Thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. I just have to correct one thing. You can only get seasons three and four oh, on oh. DVD because seasons one and two are co-owned with, by, by Sony. Oh. Uh, we, did, we, did, uh, we did some time over there. Yes, and I remember. I don't, mean to, I don't mean to make that sound like a prison situation. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we did some time over at Sony, and we just haven't been able to come to terms on a, uh, on a one and two uh, DVD. But I think maybe by the end of this year we might have, have, have worked that out. We'll see. That's wonderful. I hope so. I hope that works yeah. out because they're, they're really wonderful, although people can still see them on YouTube. Correct. Right. Yeah. Right. And are you still? Are they still broadcasting on Crackle, or is Crackle even around anymore? <laughs> I I think Crackle is around, but um, we're trying to get all of our stuff up on our site now because uh. Uh, we had everything up there with the Crackle links, and the crack, Crackle links are dead now. So uh, okay. um, we want people to be able to have access to all these all the episodes, so we're, we're working real hard right now to get everything up on our website. Yeah. So we'll see, we'll see. Hopefully that'll happen in the next couple of weeks. Well, anybody who loves a series, you know, if you're really hooked into Lost or Game of Thrones, you're going to love Mr. Deity. And watch it from the beginning, you know, and all the way through, because they're really, they're really wonderful, every single one. Um, but let, let's, let me start asking a couple questions here so our audience can get a little uh, more, uh, um, you know, affiliated with what, the, what you do and what the series is about. Sure. Um, so, um, from the creative end, how did the series come about? Your film. Talk a little bit about your film background, um, about the cast, and financing these productions. Right. I had um, I had I had done a movie in two thousand two. It was uh, it's my first film that I movie. I can't call it a film because we didn't shoot on film, but a motion picture. I'll, I'll call it a uh, moving picture. <laughs> and it did fairly well on the uh, festival circuit. It's uh, it's how I met Jimbo, who plays uh, um, Larry on the show. We yeah. had a, a film festival, and Sean and Amy were both in the film. 
um, Sean I cast from a casting call and Amy I had known for umpteen years yeah. and um, we had done that and it, it had done fairly well it got a distribution offer and actually several and everyone at IFP told me don't don't take it remake the movie and so we had decided we're going to remake the movie but with the same cast because everyone was so amazing so we had no names which is the death knell of trying to get funds to, to remake a movie. So we had, I had written these uh, deity episodes inspired by the, the first one inspired by the tsunami uh, yeah. in 2000, what was that, 2004, I think. Um, Mr. Deity and the Evil about why would we need natural disasters and stuff. Uh -huh. um, and I tried to cast it for years and I couldn't get anyone interested. I thought I was going to have the guys who were in my movie play the the main, uh, you know, Mr. Deedee and Larry, because they were genius in my movie and they didn't want to have anything to do with yeah. it. So uh -huh. I sat on it two years and finally Larry, uh, Jimbo rather, talked me into trying to shoot it ourselves, which uh -huh. we did. And uh, we had to shoot the first episode uh, three times because I was so awful. Um, <laughs> in front of the camera was my first time and also I just didn't know how to direct and act at the same time so it was it was uh, it didn't go well but uh, you know I think what you see in the, in the first episode is fairly good I, ha I hate watching myself in that yeah. one but uh, it's it's the, the writing behind it I think is very solid and that's you know I I'm I would consider myself first a, a writer and uh, last an actor uh -huh. so, uh, yeah, so that's how the that's how the series started, and, and then you know we we got a lot of traction very early on, and you know within three months we were getting contacted by big six media companies and wow. uh, all kinds of stuff. And this, we did the second season with Sony, almost did a third with them, but uh, decided to call it quits and, uh, and just go back on our own. So yeah. it's funded completely by. Um, supporters of the show we i have a begging segment at the yeah. end of uh, every episode since we started at, you know middle of season three actually i think we started begging segments to support the show yeah. and people are very generous and they they're willing to support stuff that they like and i'm not you know by any means making a fortune on this i'm barely getting by and uh but it's, you know, it's something I love doing, and I'd rather be doing this right now than anything else. So. Yeah. Well, they're, they're really wonderful, and that this is one of the reasons I wanted to get you uh, do an interview with you, because I really like to promote what I think is good art. And uh, I really do appreciate these, these episodes and the work that goes in. I mean, it's really high quality. Uh, you know, it's not... Yeah, you, Pardon? Jimbo and I both have uh, Jimbo and I both have uh, video production backgrounds, and uh, I have a boatload of equipment, so ah. it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> well, talk about that a little bit. You know, the your your background in film. How did you you know decide this is you know the path I want to go down? Well, I I don't know that I did. I just kind of uh, you know I used to make eight millimeter movies when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. We used to do this all the time. Um, made my last one when I was 17 for a senior project, um, but used to edit them all myself, you know, the old-fashioned way, and yeah. add in soundtrack stuff and all kinds of stuff like that. It was crazy the way you had to do things back then. Yeah. And I, I had a photography background as well. I studied photography for three years and did a little professional photography. Uh -huh. And then got into, I was a musician as well, so I had a music career going for many years, did a couple uh -huh. albums and all that kind of stuff. And and then got hooked into doing graphic design. I had a graphic design studio for 20 years. Oh. Uh, worked a lot for the, you know, the um, Cap Cities radio stations out here in California and uh, Clear Channel down in San Diego and that kind of stuff. Wow. I think. And I decided, you know, when digital cameras started to get down to a reasonable price where they looked pretty darn good and you could grab pick one up for around five thousand dollars and shoot a movie on your own yeah I just, my my friend actually bought the camera and he said you know i had just bought a house and he said now we have a set and we have a camera so write something and let's shoot it and that's how the first movie came about oh. and since then i kind of since doing that i kind of transitioned into video production jimbo was already doing video production we met and clicked and yeah. that's you know that's basically the background we've we, i've been doing 
that pretty much ever since and no longer have the design studio or anything like that. So if this goes to, to pot, I'm completely kaput. <laughs> just a series of coincidences or just good luck, you think? Destiny? Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, you know, life just kind of goes, and it, you have to just follow where it takes you. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, you know, I'm 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 pretty happy about the path I'm on now. We're just about yeah. to shoot. We're just about to shoot um, a pilot for a TV show, and we're wow. about to shoot an, an entire feature length film. Oh, so we're trying to get all of that done this summer. That's fantastic. Keeping deity up and words and ways yeah. of mister. So I'm, I'm a busy guy. Yeah, you are. Well, well, I appreciate your time. You know, I know that uh, it's very precious. And uh, like I say, anyone who watches, just the deities alone will see the, the quality. And just, the, you know, the, the way that the cast seems to work, um, it's not just the, the characters themselves, but you just feel as, as a group of actors, you all get along very well. We do. We do. Um, Jimbo... And I have been best friends for a very long time since, well, since 2002. I guess that's 10 years, not a super long time. Um, Sean and I go back to the same time period because he was in my first movie. And both of those guys I absolutely love to death. I yeah. can't begin to tell you how much, I mean, they're, they're just great, both of them. And then Amy, uh, um, you know, I've known her for 20, almost 23 years now. Wow. And uh, we got married uh, back in 2000. God, I better remember. The time <laughs> you <started>. better. <laughs> 2009. Oh, so that's uh, recent. Yes, yes. Um, and we won't say how that's going. But, uh, <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's just um, everyone here really, you know, we, we all pretty much know each other pretty well and yeah. we all get along very well. So. I think that comes across on the, uh, on you know, on camera. Yeah. Well, l- let's let's take a little step back there because the character uh, that she plays is um, Lucy, uh, right. A.K.A. Lucifer. And right. so, uh, how much of that tension is actual reality, and how much is it good acting? <laughs> oh God. Well, um, I'd say I'd say it's it's a good seventy five percent reality 25 percent <laughs> acting um yeah it's it's there's a there's a, a kind of you know amy is great with she's she's just one of the best reacting actresses i've ever known actors i'll call her an actor mm-hmm. um she's just her facial expressions yeah. tell you everything you need to know and that's true in real life as well mm-hmm. I, mean, I can look at her and know oh boy i'm in trouble <laughs> um it's pretty much pretty much exactly the same way. Um, Sh- Sean and and Jimbo Jimbo plays a character who's not very much like how he is in real life. Jimbo is a very cool kind of mainstream cat. You know, he he digs uh, things that you know every regular guy does. He's not nerdy in any way. Mm-hmm. Um, he plays a bit of a nerd and a and a you know I give him a lot of dialogue that he you know he has to go, what the hell am I saying here? Uh, <laughs> he's not, he doesn't have a big theological background, neither does Sean. A lot of times they have to ask me, why is this funny? I don't get this. <laughs> uh, I have to explain the jokes. And yeah. go, okay, let's go along with it. Um, Amy knows her stuff pretty well on religion. She comes from a religious background, as do I. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I, I think, you know, it's, it's a combination of... of Taking the real people who we are and just you know kind of running with it at least chemistry wise, yeah. you know the chemistry is real. The everything else is just complete BS because mm-hmm. no one no one has ever had conversations like we have on Mr. Deity, which I think is part of the fun of the show. Yeah, these, these are conversations about things of things about which no one ever has conversations. I remember Jimbo, Jimbo. I wrote a line for Jimbo that was fairly involved because it had a lot of theological and philosophical terminology in it and he, he, he had a hard time with the line and it's in one of our gag reels where he's like you know he's i really i gotta say uh, you know this is the cover and i said you know people talk like this every day don't they you know and, and he, he cracked up because everything on deity 
is a potential first time conversation. Yeah. Because you don't, we don't have conversations between God and his and the devil or God and you know. Well, we have one regarding Job, but um, usually not when someone else is in the room, right? <laughs> right. Exactly. And the cameras are rolling. Yeah. So it's a, it's a it's a very unique opportunity to have conversations about things. Yeah. You know, like how do you create time? You know, yeah. do you have to have time to create time? You know, and if you do, are you really creating time? You know, it's, it's the weirdest conversations in the world, you yeah. know. I can imagine it must be, you know, especially if uh, some of this, you know, the idea of theology is new to you, you know, just it's right. almost like the uh, out of the mouths of babes, you know, that innocence right. of what kind of, you know, that's got to be crazy. And then, you know, to, to capture that is really wonderful. Right, right. Well, it's, it's uh, yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very fun to, to, to feel like you're doing something completely, you know, undone. You know, no, nobody's really had these conversations. No. There have been a few movies where they take this stuff on, Life of, Life of Brian being my favorite. Um, but, yeah, for the most part, we're doing something that's, you know, no one's really done before. And, it, and it's, it's very liberating, and it's also very, you feel like... Um, you know, there's there's just so many opportunities, and it's a gold mine, op- yeah. op- gold mine uh, opening up. Yeah. Because it's, you know, the other thing about it is, maybe even 20 years ago, you probably couldn't do a show like this. Where no. would you do it? Or or maybe 10. You where would you do this? You no. know. Yeah. The internet allows you to have this kind of freedom, which, you know, for me is like, especially if you're writing, it's like, boy, here's a here's a whole treasure trove of mm-hmm. of material that. Either has people have been afraid to do um, because you're going to get so much flack back, yeah. or just haven't thought of it because it's too revered. We can't touch it. You know, it's, it's sacred. You know, territory. Yeah, and, well, we're just, and we're just blowing away on it. When it when it first started to take off in the early days, there um, did you get a lot of flack? I didn't. I really didn't. Um, you know, I don't know if it's because I have a religious background and I kind of get where the line is i mean we got we got a lot i got a lot more aggressive in season three yeah um when we got got off sony not that sony ever restricted anything i wanted to do they were very good about pretty much giving us free reign yeah um but i just got the thing that did it for me quite frankly was proposition eight i i I had a big change when Proposition 8 here passed in California because I, I wasn't paying attention. I was, I was very apolitical. Yeah. And I didn't, I had, you know, this is a this is a blue state. Yeah. It's a very blue state. No one ever has to wonder, you know, where the, where our electoral delegates are going to go. Right. And yet, Proposition 8 passed. And I, and I, and it, and it, it really hardened me a bit because I, I was, I'm, I'm very, I'm still upset about it. Yeah. I'm still very, very upset about taking away the rights of other human beings. Um, you know, just, I mean, it's outrageous. Well, we, we kind of took it for granted, didn't we, that nothing like this, you know, people would not interfere, I, that, you know, little yeah. by little we were making progress, and then, you yeah. know, it was just going to happen, and then all of a sudden there's this, all these weird things going on between, you yeah. know, uh, the Proposition 8 and a woman's, you know, uh, body, yeah. all this weird yeah. stuff, like we went back 50 years or something, <laughs> yeah. you know? Like all of a sudden we stepped into a time warp yeah. and we got we to gotta reconsider women's rights uh, really yeah I, I i don't know how this happened yeah i i don't either i just we, we like i say i think we were taking it for granted and just not paying attention and it's, right. it's a real wake-up because it's going in a in a very strange way very strange it, it really is it's crazy so i got a little more militant about um about my anti-theism um in season three and season four was more of a you know we did season four as a prequel Mm-hmm. Um, everything yeah. takes place before the Big Bang. <laughs> I remember uh, the hair. <laughs> yeah, and Mr. Didi's working on his look. He doesn't <laughs> want to have his look down yet. Um, That's good. So um, that one is a little bit more... I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's kind of hard-hitting. I, I, I really like Mr. Didi and the barbecue, mm-hmm. which is all about hell. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and... You know, it's there's some pretty hard hitting stuff, but a lot of it's story driven, and we I think we lost a good deal of our audience by, you know, the show had always been 
just kind of here and there. You could do anything you wanted. Mm-hmm. Uh, it had no, it followed no timeline per se. But season four was was um, you know completely. If you missed episode three, episode four was going to have stuff uh. that you didn't that you didn't understand. Yeah, yeah, and. And I think it. I think I kind of screwed myself a little bit that way. But we're coming back. You know, we've got a lot of. Uh, we're going back. We went to our own format for season five, and I think we're six or seven episodes mm-hmm. in, and people people are really liking it again. So. Yeah. Not well, that they didn't like you know, no. it's a good thing. It, it's hard if you just, you know, you just drop in somebody says, oh, this is a great series, go watch it, and then they happen upon that instead of starting from the beginning. It right. it makes it a little difficult. Well, you know, right. it, it, this is a good segue time now. Uh, we talked just a bit about uh, the, the creative element uh, between the cast members and um, your relationship with your wife and as an actress. How true are words? to what you're doing uh, words, in real life. You know, I always, I always say words ha- always has an element of truth to it, but we, you don't know which element uh, is true. Yeah. Um, f- for instance, in the, in the first episode, I really am kind of, I have a little bit of the obsessive compulsive thing, and I do go on little rants about things that I'm, that I'm, either upset about or I find interesting and they generally turn into bits mm-hmm. and that's what you know I, I thought it was it's just funny the idea of a character who's always basically making a bit of things mm-hmm. and I do that in my real life and I get in trouble sometimes mm-hmm. because I don't know when to it's not that I don't know it's basically that I don't care if I find something funny <laughs> I'm going for it I can't <laughs> help myself I'm addicted yeah. to to funny and you know, sometimes I'll be inappropriate in that way, and uh, people who know me and love me are okay with it, but sometimes we're not always with people who know me and love me, <laughs> so I end up in trouble. Yeah. Um, the, second, the second episode, which is my favorite thing that I have ever written, really? called OK, uh-huh. um, was based on something real. It was not, it, I was not the guy who was so super incredibly insensitive um, I'm not generally, but I know people who are. I, we, we, Jimbo and I used to work for a guy who was the most narcissistic, insensitive person mm-hmm. ever on the planet. Yeah. And the character that I play in there is, is kind of loosely based on him. Ah, uh, that's good uh, to it's know. A lot of, <laughs> it's a lot of me and how I think and everything, but the insensitivity and that kind of stuff is largely based on this guy. Yeah. Um, because he cracked me up. It yeah. killed me. I thought it was the funniest thing that a human being could be that absolutely insensitive. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I mean, if you met him, it would just blow you away. Yeah. Uh, so, so he's um, still alive. <laughs> he's still alive. Yeah. And does he and know that alive. it's based on him? That character? No, no he doesn't. No, I don't think so. <laughs> um, and I both are rid of him because he was truly, truly one of the most awful people we have ever known in our lives. I mean, just a disgusting human being. Yeah. Uh, but he's doing very well, yeah. you know, as those people frequently do. Yeah, but, that's true. Um, uh, so that in that episode, for instance, you know, I'm told by a dear friend that a mutual friend has committed suicide, mm. and, I'm, and I'm very not bummed by it. You know, I'm, I'm like, yeah, okay, yeah. No, uh, uh, <laughs> and now that yeah. that really didn't happen, but it didn't happen to me. Yeah. And the conversation didn't go from that point on like it. Uh-huh. But, you know, you know. And then in episode three, the thing about the the uh, the viewing where I didn't actually knock on a casket, but I almost knocked on a casket, and everything around that story otherwise is fairly true, except for the food at the viewing. Yeah. Um, so. There's a lot of truth in those episodes. Yeah. We're about to shoot another one, which is totally, absolutely, completely true through and through. Mm-hmm. There's nothing that didn't really happen. There's not even really any exaggeration because you don't have to exaggerate it because it was so funny, <laughs> the thing that actually happened that I don't have to even, it, uh, it like wrote itself. Wow. Based on a real incident. So <laughs> those little gifts. I always try to keep that kind of stuff true. Here's the funny, one of the funniest things to me is the episode with Kenny, mm-hmm. who's played by Sean, we're all playing ourselves with our, our own names. When I told him about the idea, he didn't want to do it. 
playing yeah. himself as his own, own name. And a lot of that conversation that you see in that episode, while it's been kind of screwed with, mm-hmm. Sean really didn't want to play himself. Uh, yeah. And I thought, dude, because I told him the character is very insecure. He's completely the opposite of you. He, in real life, he's completely insecure, and he's, he does well, does poorly with the ladies and, you know, and all that kind of stuff. And he says, well, I have to use my real name. <laughs> And he got all insecure and turned into the character. And I, I, we both laughed. They said, dude, you're going method on me. I, I started shooting. Yeah. And we had a great laugh. There. And I said, this has to be our episode. Right? Yeah. You know. And so it's, it's, I love shooting that show. I, yeah. I, I, uh, we don't get enough time to do it and we don't have as many fans but I, I, it's a real favorite of mine I do I really I really enjoyed it was it was a really nice treat when it just popped up and I thought oh well are they done with deity are they just going to go into this now and then I saw it and I thought well this is a really nice transition it, even if you were or weren't well, we it, started it we, we started it because we were on such a long hiatus between seasons two and three because Sony's was Sony and, and, uh. and uh, we were both trying to figure out if we wanted to do another season together. Yeah. And they wanted to do something which they thought they were going to be able to do, which they couldn't. Um, and it, But it took a long time to find out they couldn't. Mm. So um, I started that in the in the in between because I felt like I had to do something. I was just mm-hmm. losing losing uh, interest from people left and right. Yeah, yeah, you got to keep going. You know, right? So, right. so I see that the beginning is. It seems like there's a string of pearls. Is that what the words mean, or is there, you know, some sim, uh, symbolic uh, connection with the pearls that come in the introduction? You know, as words, as a string of pearls, or am I no, reading something I, else into it? It was just no, a nice graphic. I, I thought that that graphic that graphic reminded me of because. One of the things that I wanted to have, I was going to do originally with Word, is I, I thought it would be funny to have everything be a telephone conversation. Ah. So um, I felt that, that that little graphic thing, which is just a template you can get in Motion, uh, Apple's Motion program, mm-hmm. I thought the template conveyed kind of like, you know, the, the transmission of digital Word information across you know, how many over miles. And, Mm -hmm. you know, it was a different way to shoot, too, because the way we shot that, like me and Jim, all of Jimbo's stuff, we literally are on the phone. Yeah. Having a conversation on the phone. He he is in Temecula, 130 miles away from me, and he's shooting on his end, and I'm shooting on my end, and then he sends me a disc. Wow. We put it together, but you're literally <laughs> getting the conversation that we're having. Oh, that's wonderful. So, yeah, yeah, that's, so it, it is. I was originally going to stick with that, but it felt very limiting after the first yeah. episode. So. Um, our first two episodes. Well, I guess, so. you know, in, in, a, in a way it can be so many different scenarios because words are words, right? Right, um, exactly. Yeah. And uh, we, we wanted to try to have, like, one word always be prominent in the in the episode, you know, first one is bit and okay, and um, you know, cobbler. Yeah. I, I guess I, when I saw the graphic, I just thought, you know, words like a string of pearls that each one is very precious, right? Right. You know. Well, that's so. work yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That was my thought. I thought, oh, that's, you know, it's, it's a little um, grandma-ish, but, you know, I thought that's okay because that there, there's something sweet about that, too, <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. Right. Well, let, let's see now. Um, uh, I, I want to put this a little bit aside and just see if we can talk a little bit about um, your 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 biography, you know, growing up and your religious background because that seems to play not just – um, from a, a, an actor's point of view or a writer's point of view um, about theology, but in your real life too, that transition right. and you know you're kind right. of on the uh, what would they say uh, out there on the the market for um, promoting secular humanism, uh, right. and that that seems to play a, a big part. So would you tell us a, a bit about your your biography, your religious background, and sure. how you went from Mormonism? to an atheist or a secular humanist? Sure. I, I grew up Mormon. My mom was a true believer, and my dad was kind of a... He joined the church just to keep peace in the family and that kind of stuff, and was always a bit of a skeptic. So mm-hmm. I had that going in. I got religion with a vengeance, as Woody Allen would say, when I was 17, and mm-hmm. I became 
quite the zealot. Hmm. And I studied like few people do, because when I throw myself into something, it's, it's 190%. So, and it wasn't just my religion. I studied everything. I ended up with a Jewish theologian studying, you know, the Hebrew Bible for years. Um, and I uh, got a real sense of it. And then um, just as I grew older and my interest broadened and everything like that, I, I think I just, I just picked up a lot more critical thinking skills. Mm -hmm. That, you know, one of the things I think that really helped me find my way out of religion is I was so certain I had the truth that I wasn't afraid to look at the other side. Um, And I wanted to look at the other side because I wanted to combat it. And I did a lot of looking at the other side. And at a certain point, I went, holy crap, I can't, I don't have a good comeback. Yeah, yeah. Um, And so... My religion slipped away, which was which was very difficult because when you're when you're a Mormon, your your religion yeah. is your life. Yeah, it's a very it's a very um, and I, I don't say this in a pejorative way. It's very totalitarian. Yeah, maybe there's no other way you can say totalitarian other than pejorative. But um, what I all I mean by that is that it it really takes up every aspect of your life. Yes, I mean it it is all, an all consuming religion. It's not like something you just do on Sunday or Easter or Christmas. It's you are in it hip deep, and because it has no paid ministry, you're always doing something with regard to the religion because everybody in the church has to work together and bring mm-hmm. it together. So when I left, I left a life behind. I left yeah. a whole life. I left but- friends and colleagues, and you know, you you don't leave and then just continue being buddies with with everybody. There. Yeah, I mean it's it's. It's over. And I, you have to start in your life. I know my uh, my understanding of Mormonism, and I've studied Mormonism, but that, that whole pioneer spirit, you know, uh, right. of everything that they went through and to get across, you know, you needed somebody. And if, if you were going to stick with them, you were out in the wilderness on your right. own. And, right. and it seems like that sort of stayed with the church. Sure. It did. Very much so. Yeah. So I, I you know, I got out... Um, and I didn't really know who I was. I, you know, you have to kind of figure out now, well, what do I, you know, what do I believe and all of that, which, which was very exciting to me because for the first time it was going to be my choice, you know. Uh-huh. Uh, we grow up and we have these ideas kind of put on us. And we never really choose them. And it was, a, it was a fun time to be kind of just figuring out who I was. The, the great irony to me is that the person who led me to, skepticism and real real you know critical thinking was dr laura who ah. <laughs> just at just at the time that i was getting out this is before she got religion with a vengeance yeah um she had written an article because you know i was still very right wing i was very conservative still very i had a religious mindset still yeah. very much when i left and she had written an article on false memory syndrome in skeptic magazine which is michael Shermer's. A publication, and she, I, I didn't know it. I, I mean, I, she was on the board of Skeptic Magazine, so she was a good. Huh. Skeptic. And I picked up the magazine, mm-hmm. and I read her article, and then I read the rest of the magazine, and I thought, oh my, oh my, oh my heck, which is what I would have said at the moment. Oh my heck, <laughs> these are my people. Yeah. I, you know, I realized, and then I started getting connected up with this Skeptic Society, which was not far from me. You know, it was a twenty-five minute drive to go to Caltech and start hearing the lectures, and then I became friends with Michael, and I I was designing at the time, so I designed the layout for Skeptic Magazine, um, and they used that iteration for maybe 10, 12 years, um, and just got connected with that group, and then became more and more, uh, you know, part of that community. So... Uh, it's a strange, it's a strange path yeah. uh, that gets you there. That, that gets you to anti-theism in essence, but through Dr. Laura. That's a strange. <laughs> yeah. strange, strange it it is very ironic in a in, in a lot of ways, and. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I understand, you know, I think she she came to the conclusion that you know people need to be controlled because they don't know how to think, <laughs> and maybe that's yeah, why. You know, I think she, that's a lot of. Uh, I think when you're dealing with the public a lot like that and you're hearing the stories that she's hearing all day yeah. long, yeah, I think you could easily come to that conclusion. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, and then we could look at our political system too, <laughs> right. <laughs> which right. which which I'd like to to transition to in, in a moment. But um, so so go on about your connection here uh, with uh, uh, Dawkins and um, the the late Christopher Hitchens, and um, yeah, tell tell us more how that sort of grew. Was it the deity? Well, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, it's all it's all through through deity. I mean, I'm not, I don't want to make the you know anyone believe that I'm you know I'm best friends with Richard Dawkins and Christopher Hitchens, whom I never met. I I got to see him in person once very late when he was very ill, mm-hmm. and he was mobbed by people. Um, I I someone told me he had heard, heard, heard seen the show and liked it, um, wanted yeah. to beat him, you know, badly, but didn't get a chance to, and it's probably one of my biggest regrets that I didn't just push my way in there and say hi to him real quick. Yeah. Um, but Richard, you know, Richard and I meet up fairly frequently at, at conferences and whatnot, and uh, uh, he's a big fan of the show. Yeah. Loves the show. One of the greatest moments of my life is when <laughs> we uh, when we met uh, the first time. Uh, I, I greeted him with, Richard, you're my hero, and I got in return... No, you're my hero. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, that, yeah. I, I I will never forget that. And then they were so nice to me. And he had the whole uh, Dawkins Foundation through there. They sat me down and, and quizzed me for about an hour about the show and the ideas and everything. Like, yeah. I was the superstar, which is very sweet yeah. of them. And then, um, you know, I've met Daniel Dennett, and we, we've uh, had the occasion to hang out, too, at conferences, mm-hmm. as well as Sam Harris, um, you know, we we get to meet up every now and then. Um, we just had a, a thing uh, late last year where we it was Michael and Sam and me, and we uh, did a very private thing for a bunch of people at the Getty Villa down here in uh, in Los Angeles. And it was uh, Sam's just the, one of the coolest, sharpest guys I have ever met in my life. Mm-hmm. He's just, he is just, you know, uh, it's weird to uh, to. So idolize someone who's two years younger than me, but, but I really do. I really do just think he's amazing. He's an yeah. amazing thinker, and he's he's so courageous in his thinking and and bold and interesting, and he just blows me away. I love him, and I love Michael Shermer too. Michael Shermer is truly one of my my heroes. I mean, I, I have I have known him for almost twenty years now, mm-hmm. and he's just. One of the nicest guys you will ever meet, sharp like nobody's, you know, just sharp as a tech and prolific in his writing. Mm-hmm. He's just, he's just such an impressive mind. But his, his, he, he is equally as nice a person as he is brilliant, which is, which is so, so rare. Same with Sam. Really great I, I think it, it, you know, deity and, uh, you know, just the, the, the whole. I, what would I call it, an atheist movement or a secular humanism mm-hmm. movement? Yeah. I don't even know what to call it because it, it, it seems like there's a new definition that's being formed uh, from – because when you say the word atheist, when you say even secular humanism, you think of uh, Mao, you think of um, socialists in East Germany. Um, right. And so you okay. know that is all changing now. And and yeah. people are in a sense kind of coming out of the closet and say, yes, I I don't believe. <laughs> I think the most common thread amongst all of these people, because I I don't even know that I I don't even know that Michael would call himself an atheist. He would call himself probably an agnostic. Uh-huh. But I think the common thread in all of these people is, is anti-theism. Yeah. Um, we all understand how dangerous religion is um, and religious thinking and just this kind of a uh, totalitarian mindset yeah. of, 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 of very limited restrictions on, on you know, who gets to say that they know what about, you know, anything or anything yeah. from what kind of underwear we should be wearing to, you know, <laughs> who, who goes to, you know, who goes to hell or who gets murdered or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, that's really what it's all about. It, yeah, I think I think the door is opening, and it it seems like maybe that's part of the desperation for all this movement politically, is to close those doors because it, it, you know um, uh, as a desperate means to preserve, right. and right. perhaps maybe that's why this weird stuff is coming up, um, you know, regarding women's health and 
um, you know, just all these bills being passed uh, on abortion. Um, and, and that kind of leads us into this, you know, a little bit of this political um, uh yeah, the, the 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 election. You know, I'm kind of on the of the mind that I don't see much difference between Obama and Romney when it comes to um, who controls them. I I really think that they're kind of told what to do by Wall Street. Uh, but that's my opinion. Um, and uh, I know that when Romney ran in um, '08, uh, there was a survey that that went around, and they. They um, asked a lot of uh, Christian evangelicals if they would ever vote for Mormon. Right. And the answer came up, they would vote for a woman, a black, and a Jew <laughs> before a Mormon. Right. And I thought that was just kind of fascinating, and now that's sort of turned around. And um, you know, I'm wondering a little bit of your, about your take on this change on the idea of Mormons, uh, you know, I mean, here you have Hatch and um, Reed and, um, you know, Romney, all, you know, um, very dedicated uh, and devout right. Mormons, uh, and out of nowhere, um, right. in, in a way, that they've popped in. Although, I, if I remember correctly, uh, Joseph Smith had uh was going to run for president of the united states and he, he did run for president. yeah yes. and he he yeah. was uh it looked like he was going to win for a moment there well, until he know, was he, killed at one at one point if i remember correctly he had a larger standing army than the united states yeah uh, which which is which is kind of crazy um mormonism does have a very strong theological uh not the, theological theocratic uh, notion behind it. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, G- Jesus is is king. Uh, I mean, there's a, there's a king concept. Even the Book of Mormon says that the best kind of government would to be to, ha- to have a a benevolent king at the head. So mm-hmm. it's it's you know it's it's totalitarian through and through in that yeah. regard. Um, uh, regarding the election, I don't think Mormonism is the problem for me with with Mitt Romney <laughs> as much as it is. You know, I do think the president is very much on message about this is really an election about what kind of people we want to be. Are we going to be a people for whom opportunity is available only for the people at the top? Yeah. Or are we going to spread that around? I mean, that to me is the thing. You know, I I, I look at, at the evangelicals and I look at their their leader, the guy that they love so much, Jesus, and I don't see anything yeah. <laughs> in relation to, you know, Jesus is the guy who said from much, for, for, for those who are given more, more is required, you know, yeah. but apparently, apparently no one gets that anymore. No. Um, you know, the, the, the libertarian ideology fits so much better than, than the Christian ideology. Yeah. Um, I mean, when the Catholics are calling out the Ryan uh, budget <laughs> plan. Yeah. You know, there's you know there's there's complete cognitive dissonance between what they claim to believe in the in the church on Sunday and what they go out and talk about, um, you know, on the weekday in the, in the Senate and the House. Mm-hmm. Um, that to me is is the most important thing. I don't have a big problem with the Mormon being president per se. I don't think, you know, I I think those fears are very much like. Uh, the fears that people had about uh, John F. Kennedy, mm-hmm, think, mm-hmm. you know, is he going to bow down to Catholicism, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I, I, do, I do think there are important things that people need to know about Mormons. We're, we're about to produce a way of the mister just about the, the Mormon situation with race, which mm-hmm. I think yeah. people need to understand how Mormonism is very much a caste system, not yeah. unlike... Um, not unlike um, what they have in India, with, where people people get their position in life based on what they did in a prior life. Yeah. In this case, it's a life with with God and Jesus, and and they were we were all spirit children and whatnot. Yeah. Um, and that very much has has Mormons looking at people and not having compassion in many cases for people being in their in their stations in life because 
you know, hey, they're getting what they deserve. Yeah, you know, they right. didn't, they didn't act properly in the pre-existence, which is what they call it. Um, and and particularly that's true with regard to race. Yeah. It has been and cannot be anything but because it's essential. That idea that God punishes people by darkening their skin is an essential element of Mormonism. You cannot remove it. Yeah. It cannot be done away with it because if you do away with it, you're doing away with the entire religion, yeah. the basis of it. So, Interesting. Uh, I, I know my, my the first time I was out in Salt Lake City and I went to, um, you know, to the the visitor center and I know they wouldn't let us in the temple because you had to be a Mormon. And I I saw the displays there of the three rooms, you know, one was like a, a a modest, almost thorough kind of shack, uh, live simply. And then sort of, um, um, middle-class sort of decorative (laughs) layout. And then the French provincial. And it was, it was very clear to me right there. You know that there was this this caste system, you know, yeah. and, um, and and once you're locked in there, and then when the, it was tied to race, it it seemed to make more sense as to where they were coming from, and that right. whole mindset, and it, it is a really kind of um, an eighteen mid eighteen hundreds mindset, you know, yeah. um, yeah. it it doesn't evolve beyond that. And right. so that you know that's a little daunting, a little um, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's somewhat threatening, and I wonder, you know, uh, to what extent people will start to think and maybe perhaps even rise up and say, you know, enough or none of this. Um, and or well, those I think people. That's what they're doing with uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement. I think finally people are getting, you know, to. I mean, when you see when you see things like, I mean, all you have to do is look at this chart. There's there's one beautiful chart where they chart. Um, trickle down economics and the wages of the middle class, yeah. and they just they just flow perfectly together. How you know trickle down has has made rich people richer, mm-hmm. and it didn't trickle down to anybody. Yeah, uh, and and wages have gone completely down, and and you know you can't, people people are starting to get the idea. I think finally that. You know, that, that doesn't work. Yeah. And money to the rich. It's an Enron. It's an Enron economy is what we're living in. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's exactly so. that. Very yeah. So. And I uh, wonder, though, you know, because you have these people who are waking up, you know, and you have these people who are trying to protect what it is that they call traditional values. And right. I, I have to ask myself, are we already in a civil war? Only we're just not shooting at each other. We're we're doing it financially. Well, we're very much in an ideological war. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's it's it's. I mean, this country is so divided. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's it's basically and it's basically fifty fifty, and it's you know the coast versus the center of the country. That's what it comes down to, and I I think there is something to be said for the fact that when people are living in communities that are larger and, you know, require tolerance of more people because there's just so much more diversity. I've, I've lived in Los Angeles or near there almost my entire life, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a place of tremendous diversity. And when you, when you get that kind of thing, I think it does force you out of your more traditional and narrow way of seeing mm-hmm. the world. Yes. And you start to understand and have compassion for people who are not like you. Yes. I think it's much easier to do that because you're you're surrounded by them. Yeah, um, it's true. Where, yeah, whereas when you're in these more rural settings and uh, everybody looks like you, uh, it's, you know, it's very easy to have bigoted ideas uh, about about the other people, you know, people. You know, this, this is one of the other things that I, that I, that just kills me about, um, the evangelicals, there, there is no sense anymore of, you know, there's that great phrase, um, there but for the grace of God go I. There's no there but for the grace of God go I. There's, everybody deserves what they're getting, mm-hmm. you know, even if they're getting absolute crap. And <laughs> yeah. it, it's just not true. We're all very lucky to have been, first of all, born into this country in the first place. Yeah. We could have been, you know, in Africa starving yeah. uh, and dying before we're eight years old. Uh, you know, just there's just so much in life that is 
lust oriented and i think that's one of the one of the bigger ideological wars that we're having is do people get what they deserve in life mm-hmm. or is it a crapshoot and and are we our brother's keeper are we going to look out for those whose fortunes have not been as good as ours yeah. or are we going to sit there and say you're just lazy bums get off your ass and and yeah. can i say ass i'm sorry well, i pause this get off get I, off your butt and and you know make make things work for you well you know what it's easy for you to say, yeah. you know, put yourself in their shoes and see how that works out. Oh, well, I pose this question to evangelicals and I ask them, so, okay, you know, uh, someone has their lot here on earth and then we all die and we all go to heaven. And then what? I mean, are we socialists up there? Is everybody right. equal? Right. <laughs> so, so well, <laughs> how does that work out in your mind? You know, I mean, do you want to die now? Cause you're going to go to a socialist heaven. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's not a socialist heaven. It's a. It's a. I mean, I think. I think Christopher Hitchens hit it right on the nail. It's a celestial North Korea. Uh, <laughs> oh no! Uh, because Yikes. literally, I mean, if you if you talk to Christians and you you yeah. actually force them to think about this to the next step, and we did a, an entire episode on this just recently. You cannot have free will. Yes. In heaven. You cannot have free will which kills me because all of the, the reason, the apologetics for why the world is such a crappy place is because God had to have us free, have free will. We had to freely choose everything and blah, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. And that's, mm-hmm. that's why I can freely choose to kill you right. if, I, if I want, because we had to have free will. But for the rest of all eternity, we're mm-hmm. not going to have any free will, because you can't, because evil, evil is the reason... Free will is the reason evil exists, and you're not going to have evil in heaven. Right. So if you're not going to have evil, you're not going to have free will. So we're That's all going right. to be sitting around up there, not making any choices, do what we want to do, uh, because what we might want to do might offend God, and we can't have that. So all of our free will is stripped. We are literally uh, automatons, yes. which is what they say God didn't want us to be when we're here. It just makes no sense. Whatsoever. Well, I had uh, one philosopher tell me that uh, your free will is to come to the conclusion that you do not have free will. <laughs> yeah, or that you should give it, or that basically that you should surrender it over to God. Yeah, that's yeah. What it, that's what it comes down to. You have to surrender your free will freely. Yes, over that's to the God trick. Yeah, and realize that that you you just have to do whatever He wants you to do. Yeah, uh, I mean it's just it's just crazy stuff. Um, and, you know, it's all based on an idea of perfection, that there's only one way to do something. Yeah. You know, there's only one good way, best way to do it. And, that it, you know, that's the other thing about Christianity and Mormonism, all of that. They all have that, that idea that there is one way, and this is the way you should be doing it. And it doesn't take into account at all the diversity of human nature right. and human experience. And that, that's one of the biggest problems I see also yeah. ideologically. Well, this is a certain kind of isolationism, and, you know, I mean, there, there's a, a balance to everything, you know, the way, at least the way I think about it. But, you know, you, you brought up uh, being, you know, raised in Los Angeles or in the area. You know, I was raised in Chicago. So there was a lot of diversity there, at least as I was growing right. older. Right. Um, and then we moved up north here, and... Um, Living here, I remember I was in graduate school at the end of 1999, and one of the courses was a diversity course. So you had to actually take time to go and meet with people who were different from you. And I just thought, that's so odd. But, you know, this is the land of dairy <laughs> right. and it's, it's homogenized. And now, though, I have to say to a great extent, at least in the past decade, um, this city has, has really uh, grown in its diversity. Um, right. But there's still those dividing lines that are, are very clear. Sure. Um, sure. Our, our community here, River West, that's our motto is, you know, we, we celebrate our diversity and we try very hard to keep, uh, well, f- well, now the economy is helping us, but, you know, not to, to gentrify our neighborhood. And right. that was very close to happening, and you know the town economy protected us from that. Um, right. But it it is that that idea of diversity, and, and maybe it, you know, stepping back to FDR, you know, nothing to fear but fear itself, and uh, sure. 
uh, I think that that's part of it is that change. People fear change because change has always right. been sort of threatening, you know, or dangerous. Sure. So maybe sure. it is that kind of lizard brain kicks in, you know. Right. Um, and so. pardon? Very much so, yeah. I think. Yeah, the lizard brain. <laughs> I love that. I love that uh, that concept. I think you're right. I think you know, it's, it's it's you know, fear is a fear is a very powerful uh, survival mechanism. It is. You know, yeah. it, it serves us well. But it's you know, there's so much in life that served us well at one point that just doesn't you know do so anymore. And and yeah. I think you know, conservatism is so much about you know revering what came before yeah. trying to get back you know it's to me that's one of the things between liberals and, and conservatives it's it's you know their idea of perfection happened six thousand years ago in a garden yeah you know uh that's perfection to them yeah and they want to go back to it mm-hmm. we liberals i think see that uh, that that anything close to perfection is through the progress and moving forward and dumping what doesn't work and hasn't worked and and moving forward to something new but something yeah. new is very very scary it you is know? well it, it is we don't know it. and yeah. we do mess up and and we have made mistakes you yeah. know uh, uh, all kinds of silly ideas I, I don't care for the way the you know liberals didn't scream out at, at some of the things that were that happened during the cold war you yeah. know in, in uh, in communist societies, uh, we, we got that you know the, the that the Nazis were evil, but a lot of liberals didn't get that the, the communism was equally evil and that kind of thing. Yeah. So yeah. I, I, you know, there, there, we, yeah, we make mistakes, but uh, you know, you move on, you learn from them, and you and you grow. But you can't cloister yourself and say, no, this this works, this works, yeah. because times change, and some things that worked then aren't going to work now, and you have to be prepared to understand it, and you have to be. Con- Continually prepared to broaden your horizons. Yeah, I mean, one of, one of the reasons that that we're so divided is over something so stupid to me, <laughs> yeah. and that is because of a, a three thousand year old book written by ignoramuses. And I don't mean that again pejoratively. I'm talking; these people were as ignorant and stupid as you could possibly mm-hmm. imagine mm-hmm. in a society such as ours. Yeah, they didn't know the way the the, the planets. They didn't know. First of all, that there were, you know, that we were part of just this gigantic universe, in which tiny, a tiny little thing, and we're insignificantly spinning around a, a, a small, insignificant star. Yeah. They didn't know anything. We're on a big they, rock. That homosexuality yeah. was, a, it was an abomination. Yeah. And based on this one stupid thing, and what it really comes down to is they worship a book, <laughs> a book written 3,000 years ago. They don't worship God. They worship a book. Yeah. That they that they think is his thing, and because of that, we are we are hating our fellow human beings. Some of us are yeah. because of because they simply have a preference of one sex over the of the other in terms of, of long term, you know, uh, romantic relationships. Yeah. It, it's insane. It is. It's it's uh, really you know this this um, I don't know if it's. It, it, Again, the fear factor of hoarding, of greed, of control. Um, uh, how much does somebody need to live? A hundred million dollars isn't enough. Uh, right. a, a, a congregation right. of people who have, you know, the similar ideas. You know, you got to go out there and make them fight, and you know, a battle. I mean, those kind of words uh, it, it spark a whole different uh, feeling than have a dialogue. You know. Right. Um, right. So, yeah, changing minds, changing minds, you know, um, I, I guess progress is slow, you know. Um, I, I don't think it has to be, though. <laughs> I don't, I don't really yeah, I think we're, we're at a point right now where we, we have enough reason uh, to know where we're at and, you know, to, to say, yeah, we share something in common. Our biology, we share in common. We need shelter. We need food. We need clean water. We need education. Uh, we need to, to take care of ourselves. These are right. basic things. Why right. are we fighting over this kind of survival? You know, I, right. I, and, and, and to me, even, you know, from any religious point of view, it makes perfect sense to, you know, give that 
And we have the technology now to provide that. Yet somebody right. or a group of people feel it's very important to control who gets that. Right. You know, until they can change their minds to the way they think, perhaps. Right. I don't know. But, it, right. yeah, it, you know, it's wise up already. <laughs> you want to slap a few people here. <laughs> well, we we got we to... Gotta... We got to loosen our, ourselves from this, you know, the shackles that are holding us back. Mm-hmm. And I, I think, you know, there is nothing. This is one of the reasons why we do Mr. Deity because I don't think there is anything, any other ideology that is so pervasively destructive mm-hmm. toward that kinds of moving forward than religion, Western monotheistic, monotheistic religion. Mm-hmm. There, there's just nothing that can touch it in terms of. Of, of messing up everything. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, an, it's an ideology that that has people completely shackled. Do you think I mean, that... Do you think in the United States there would ever be a free state? I don't want to say an atheist state or a secular human state or an agnostic state, but a state where... A, 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 you know, like you have cities, you know, across the United States that are gay communities, cities that are right. across that right. are, you know, um, uh, you know, very, very fundamentalist kind of communities. You have Salt Lake City full of Mormons. Um, right. Will there be, is there some place that uh, people are gathering who are free thinkers? Well, I think a lot of the larger cities in the country are, are you know, headed in that direction. I, mm-hmm. I think... I think we have seen an explosion in free thought and secularist ideas in the last 10 years, largely because of the Internet. Mm-hmm. Um, one, one, of the, one of the things that religion does, and I know this from being within one that does it quite well, is it keeps people sequestered in their own little narrow world of how we need to think about things. Mm-hmm. and And... You can't do that anymore. You, it's literally impossible to keep people inside because they're on the Internet every day and they're exposed to all kinds of ideas. Now, they, they can self-censor, and a lot of people do. Mm-hmm. I, I did that a little bit when I was Mormon, but I, like I said, I was so convinced I, was, I had the truth that I didn't feel like I needed to be worried about anything. Mm-hmm. So I, didn't, I, I, I wasn't scared. I just went out and looked at everything. So many people are doing that now. I yeah. can't tell you how many times I'll meet, in particular, other foremans, as I like to say, former Mormons, um, <laughs> who have said to me, who have said to me, you know, I ask every, basically every former Mormon that I meet, or foreman, <laughs> what got you? And they'll, it's, I can't begin to tell you how many times, well, you know, I found some information on the internet that, you know, yeah. nobody could answer. Um, none of my church leaders had good answers for yeah. And then I realized, you know, th- this, you know, we had a revolution in Europe yeah. because of the, the, because of Gutenberg and his, and his, and his uh, printing press. Yeah. Um, have I got that name right? That sounded weird coming out of my mouth. Yeah. Gutenberg. Yeah. Gutenberg, yeah. So <laughs> th- this is another information age. You know, yeah. that was the old information age. This is the new information age. Yeah. Last time it inspired the American Revolution because, I, you know, great ideas got out. Yeah. Uh, and we're, at, we on, we're on the verge of it again. If you look at, I don't know if you saw this study uh, last week, but among millennials, yeah. um, belief in, in, in religion uh, has gone down 15% in the last five years. I noticed... And, when I was looking up some stats on atheism, that it was thirteen percent, and I yeah. remember I, I, the last time I remember even hearing that was something like one or less than one percent. Maybe that's well, twenty years ago. Millenn- uh, among millennials, now only sixty-five percent don't have doubts about God and religion. Isn't it something? So yeah. 30, 35 percent among the younger generation are are kind of going. Hey, this is yeah. Well, um, knowledge is power, right? Knowledge is power, yeah. right? And, and you we, can't beat logic. Yeah. Pardon? I'm sorry. You can't beat logic. No, you can't. And you know, one of one of the you, you talked about changing minds and everything. And one of the yeah. things that we do, in particular, with deity, yeah, that really has never been done about religion. This is this is our my guiding philosophy for the show. If you want to change minds, there was a study years ago that was. 
someone talked about it, Tam, one of the Tams that I was at years ago, mm -hmm. about if you want to change people's minds, the best way to do it is to concretize what people believe, but they believe it. You know, we believe so much on the abstract. Yeah. You know, we talk about, we talk about for instance, the, the instance that they gave is people say they want to outlaw abortion. Okay, so what does that mean? Do you, let's say you have a woman who has three children. She can't afford to take to have another she's in the first trimester of her pregnancy she gets an abortion do you want her going to jail now and those kids going into foster care and the doctor going to prison is that what you need is that mm -hmm. what you want it when you get concrete in yeah. what you're talking about yeah. people go well n no i don't want that it's that they have an abstract idea of they they don't like something but they don't want to they don't go to the next step of what are the consequences yeah. if we do this you know there's a great little thing out now about abortion which a woman says you know abortions are still going to take place the only difference is now they're going to be unsafe and you're, you're going to have people dying of botched abortions yeah um and and fully grown humans not not uh, fetuses without a nervous system they they, they re he really did take and take instances of you know child labor for instance yeah and, and orphanages and that kind of stuff and say Look at this! What we're doing. This is the concrete reality. Yeah. You know, you people walk by the orphanage, and or by you know the place that's employing ch child labor. But this is what goes on. Is this, this the society we want to live in? Yeah. So, and th that's what I'm calling out to people: is yeah. this is this the is this what you want people to believe? Yeah. That, you know, I, I'm saved and I go to heaven, but everybody else gets tortured. How are you going to be happy in heaven knowing that your your relatives or every Jew you've ever known mm. is being burned uh, eternally? Yeah, I don't. I, that's not heaven to me. No, no. You know, I'm, I'm losing my free will, and and every loved one that I know who didn't think the same way I do is being tormented and tortured forever. You, I think that I think that is changing, at least in this this nation. Um, I, I, but I think it because again, the internet um, and under you know having access to education, knowledge, right. and by cutting education, by cutting off that knowledge. You keep people right. slaves, you know. And well, look, and look who wants to and look who wants to cut <laughs> information and knowledge. Yeah. I mean, Rick, San, Rick Santorum made yeah. everything so perfectly clear. I cannot begin to tell you yeah. when he talked about how how people who go to, go to to college are so much more likely to lose their religion. Yeah, why do you think that is? Because they're getting smarter. Come yeah. on. I mean, that was, that was the biggest... I couldn't believe that it, someone was finally saying it on their side. Yeah, go to college, lose your faith. Yeah. And that's not because they've been brainwashed. It's because they've been unbrainwashed. But, you know, or, the, the thing you know, is the with... Thing about the snob, yeah. going, everyone going to college is... Yeah. <laughs> the thing about Centaurum is I don't think he believed him. <laughs> I think after he said I, that, he said, what did I say? <laughs> he had that look yeah. on his face. And then he thought, well, I got a good reaction. I better go with that. So, you know, there's a, right. politicians are first one liars, two opportunists. So, you know, right. uh, that's my <laughs> cynical point of view of anybody who goes but, into but politics. It's, it's very true. <laughs> I mean, they, they very much do. I know within Mormonism, there is very much a push to keep your the knowledge that you do get yeah. within this narrow confine uh. of what they what the church considers knowledge. Yeah. yeah. And there's there are warnings about becoming smart yeah. and becoming an educated person. There are warnings in the Book of Mormon about, you know, you don't want to be too smart. <laughs> I mean it's like really? Really? I can't be too smart and stick with the program? Okay. Uh, yeah. There's such a uh, joy in knowledge. That's what's so absolutely. depressing about it. You know, uh, yeah. th these efforts. Um, but I guess, I guess for some, they think, well, then, you know, you become depressed, you become unreasonable, you become withdrawn, you know, and that's a bad thing. And you know what? It's not always a bad thing. It's, it's good to reflect. Right. And, and those moments are really what makes us, I guess one could say, human. You know, to, sure. to mull over things that are sad and say, why? And what can I do to change that? And rather well, than saying, know. just don't think about it. <laughs> move right. on. You just, move up, you just live a more real life, which makes yeah. you have more compassion for other human beings. 
and and broadens your own horizons. Yeah, sometimes it, I mean it broadens your horizons in every way, on the downside mm-hmm. and on the upside. But it's I would rather have a bigger, broader life than a smaller, narrow one. That's that's happy and where I'm happy because I'm I'm ignorant. You know, ignorance is bliss kind of thing. Yeah. I would rather be, you know, quite frankly, I would rather be a little miserable and and just have access to a larger world of ideas than than to stay within the, you know, the straight and narrow, as they say. Well, that's wonderful. And that's probably a good place for us to end. <laughs> Okay. Because we've been going for quite a while, and boy, exactly. you know, I would go another two hours with you, but I got uh, other people want <laughs> their space. So what yeah. I'm going to say is, please tell our audience how to contact you or and direct them to your website one more time before we go. Uh, the website is mrdeity.com, M-R-D-E-I-T-Y. Don't go Mr. Diety. Mr. Diety is <laughs> some other thing where, where you can get good solid advice on how to eat, but uh, <laughs> you're not going to get to our show. Uh, we're, we're available on YouTube, and most people see the show via our iTunes podcast, which, uh, you know, you, you click subscribe once and it downloads every time. Um, but the website has our donation page, and you can buy... Uh, DVDs and uh, get connected up to our Cafe Press uh, place, or you can just, you know, make a donation or, uh, you know, what really helps us is the financial subscription where we know how many people are mm-hmm. going to be giving, you know, a dollar a month or, yeah. you know, five dollars a week or whatever uh, people can afford. Click that um, button. Click that button. <laughs> click that button. And we have a lot of things going now. Cause it's, you know, we have words and we have the way of the mister, which is kind of a spinoff um, of Mr. Deity, where we get a little more serious, yeah, uh, about some of these some of these issues, and we've got some more of those coming up real quick too. And there's those are more expensive to produce, so anything anybody can do is, is just very helpful. Well, I can just say how delightful you know these these uh, the the series, all of them, everything that you've done has just been wonderful, and I you know I can't wait until the next one. And uh, when well, it buddy, pops up in my you. subscriptions, it's the first thing I click on. <laughs> Everything wow, stops. You. Everything stops. Okay, That's so great. let me just take this moment. I want to thank our guest, Brian Keith Dalton, for joining us today on Three Words. I hope to speak to you again in the future and delve further into human secularism along with uh, the progress of the show and other things that you're producing. Um, it's, it's been so wonderful to speak to you. Um, And as someone who's doing and working in an intelligent media, that's real important. So uh, let me just say spread the word of our efforts to bring enlightened voices and topics that affect your life in the community, the nation, and the world. Our shows are archived for your convenience at riverwestradio.com and uh, forward slash River West Radio and over at youtube.com at Three Words Radio and also at River West Radio on YouTube. Um, we hope you will listen and continue to support your public community radio waves. Remember, you own them. Support and take good care. This is Eliza Brooks, and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for listening. That was great. That's all.